Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. We left off in Daniel chapter 2 as Babylon's King Nebuchadnezzar had a series of disturbing dreams. Now, be aware that we're not going to come close to finishing chapter 2 of this lesson because there's a lot more here than meets the eye. The king called his flock of seers and and enchanters and magicians and astrologers all together and told them he needed to have this persistent and troubling dream of his interpreted. However, before he'd listened to an interpretation first, they had to prove themselves by telling him the details of the dream itself. But even more, if they couldn't tell him the subject of his dream, they'd be executed. Well, after some back and forth between the king and his seers, they admitted it was humanly impossible for any man to know another man's dreams. Well, the king promptly ordered that all of his seers in the capital city of Babylon were to be killed, their family homes destroyed, because he lost any faith that they had legitimate gifts to to interpret dreams or to see the future. Now, this mass execution was to include Daniel and his three Jewish friends, who, the timing seems to indicate, were still in the midst of their three-year education that was part of the process of changing their identity from Hebrew to Babylonian. Now, when Daniel is informed of this harsh decree, he pleads with Aryok, the chief of King Nebuchadnezzar's royal bodyguard, to give him an audience with the king because he believes that with a little time he can satisfy the king's demand concerning his dreams. Daniel and his three cohorts pray to the Lord to reveal to them the secret of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. The Lord responds. Daniel, who we're told in chapter 1, had the spiritual gift of deciphering dreams and visions, was naturally the one to whom God communicated the meaning. And it happened in a waking vision at nighttime. In a most appropriate response, Daniel prayerfully thanked the Lord for saving them for giving him the key to unlock the king's dream. Well, let's reread a portion of Daniel chapter 2. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 1099. Daniel chapter 2. We're going to start reading at verse 19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision at night, And Daniel blessed the God of heaven in these words. Blessed be the name of God from eternity past to eternity future. For wisdom and power are his alone. He brings the changes of seasons and times. He installs and deposes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and and knowledge to those with the discernment. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what lies in the darkness, what light dwells with him. I thank and I praise you, God of my ancestors, for giving me wisdom and power and revealing to me what we wanted from you, for giving us the answer for the king. So Daniel went to see Aryok, whom the king had charged with destroying the sages of Babel, and said to him, Don't destroy the sages of Babel. Bring me before the king. I'll give the king the interpretation. Well, quickly, Aryok brought Daniel before the king and told him, I have found one of the exiles of Judah who will reveal the interpretation to his majesty. And the king said to Daniel, who had been renamed Belteshazzar, Can you tell me what I dreamt and what it means? And Daniel answered the king, No sage or exorcist or magician or astrologer can tell his majesty the secret he's asked about. But there is a God in heaven who unlocks mysteries. And he has revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the Ahrit Hayamim. Here are your dream and the visions you had in your head when you were in bed. Your majesty, 
When you were in bed, you began thinking about what would take place in the future, and he who reveals secrets has revealed to you what will happen. Yet this secret has not been revealed to me because I am wiser than anyone living, but so that the meaning can be made known to your majesty, and then you can understand the thoughts of your own mind. Your majesty had a vision of a statue, very large, extremely bright. It stood in front of you, and its appearance was terrifying. The head of the statue was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its trunk and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet, partly of iron, partly of clay. And as you watched, a stone separated itself without any human hand. It struck the statue on its feet made of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces, which became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind blew them away without leaving a trace. But the stone which had struck the statue grew into a huge mountain, filled the whole earth. That is what you dreamt. Now we will give the king its interpretation. Your majesty, king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom the power, the strength, and the glory so that whenever people, wild animals, or birds in the air live, he has handed them over to you. He's enabled you to rule them all. You are the head of gold. But after you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to you. Then a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule the whole world. The fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron. Iron can break anything into pieces, pulverize it, crush it. So just as iron can crush anything, this kingdom will break the other kingdoms into pieces and crush them. Finally, You saw the feet and toes made partly of pottery clay, partly of iron. This will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the firmness of iron, since you saw the iron mixed with the clay from the ground. Just as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. You saw the iron mixed with clay. That means that they will cement their alliances by intermarriages, but they won't stick together any more than iron blends with clay. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not pass into the hands of another people. It will break to pieces and consume all those kingdoms. But it itself will stand forever, like the stone you saw, which without human hands separated itself from the mountain and broke to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has revealed to the king what will come about in the future. The dream is true. Its interpretation is reliable. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshipped Daniel. He ordered that a grain offering and an incense be offered to him. To Daniel, the king said, Your God is indeed the God of God, the Lord of kings, a revealer of secrets, since you have been able to reveal this secret. The king promoted Daniel to a high rank, gave him many rich gifts, made him governor of the entire province of Babel, head of all the sages of Babel. At Daniel's request, the king put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in charge of the affairs of the province of Babel, while Daniel remained in attendance to the king. What's important for us to know about this prayer of thanksgiving is that Daniel essentially acknowledges God's fundamental characteristics. He is an eternal God. He possesses all wisdom and power. He controls time. He brings on the seasons. He is the ultimate ruler over all human governments, anywhere, in every age. And he permits kings to reign, and he removes them from power at his will. The God of Israel, whose name is Jehovah, dispenses divine wisdom to the wise, heavenly knowledge to those who have discernment. But it's a given that true wisdom and discernment can only be bestowed upon a person by Jehovah. All others counterfeit. Verse 22 explains that God knows what is hidden in the darkness and that light dwells with him. The Aramaic word that is translated to English is chashok. Chashok, which in Hebrew is a word that we've discussed on numerous occasions, beginning with Genesis 1, and that word is choshech. 
And choshek isn't referring to the absence of visible light like nighttime. Rather, it's a word that means spiritual darkness. It has an evil tone to it. And thus, the English word light in this passage more correctly refers to enlightenment. And so the verse is meant to connect with the previous one that speaks of knowledge and discernment. God knows what's happening in the physical sphere of evil that is inherent to man's evil inclination and also in the spiritual sphere of evil that is Satan and his minions. And yet, whatever enlightenment exists in our universe or any other dimension emanates from the Lord. In fact, that enlightenment is intrinsic to his makeup and his nature. Daniel's prayer ends by him identifying with the God of Israel, who is also the God of Daniel's ancestors. And so once again, this weighty issue of identity is just thrust front and center. At this point now, <clears throat> we're going to detour for a few minutes. Another one of these famous detours. Into something that's anything but academic or trivial, or frankly, even easy to hear. Rather, it's, in our time, prophetic, and it's heading towards catastrophe. I want to begin by stating a God principle, which it would behoove all Christians and Jews to embrace. We can only ascertain God's identity in the same way Daniel's outlined for us by means of God's name and his inherent attributes. That's how we know God. And it might seem within Judeo-Christianity that discerning God's identity is a long-settled matter. And so to re-examine it has little bearing on modern Christianity or Judaism. But in fact, God's identity, and thus especially as believers, who we identify with, has become muddled. God's identity has become muddled and compromised. Even though most Christians and many Jews who occupy our synagogues and churches are unaware of it. Because of the resurgence of Islamic influence, especially in the Western world, there's this concerted effort, mostly by well-meaning Christians, to find a pathway to a middle ground in order to achieve peace with the Muslim world. One of the new focuses of Christian missionary work is now aimed, rightly so, at the more than one billion Muslims on our planet. And due to much failure to make very many converts, a new approach is underway that seems to be achieving better results. And that approach is to explain to Muslims that their God and the God of the Christians is the same God. And further, that their holy book, the Koran, is just as valid and just as worthy as is the Hebrew Scriptures and is the Christian Bible. Thus, Christians ought to feel free to learn the customs and the prayers of Muslims, join them in their mosques as they worship Allah all together one voice, and that Muslims ought to reciprocate by joining Christians in churches and praying with believers. The so-called emergent church is quite open to this concept. Even a new term called Chrislam has been coined to identify this movement within Christianity. Now, I personally encountered this phenomenon well over a decade ago as I was working in an executive capacity at an evangelical megachurch. The pastor dropped a booklet on my desk. He asked me to review it and then tell him how many we needed to order. It had been produced by the missions board of this well-respected evangelical denomination, and because the annual missions week focus was only a few weeks off, hundreds of thousands of this booklet had been printed in order to hand out to the many congregations that form this denomination. 
And the booklet, booklet essentially explained to the denominational membership for, that for the sake of spreading the gospel of Christ, we ought to accept that Allah is the same as Jehovah and the same as the God of Israel. And that there's nothing wrong with the Koran as a holy book. And that we ought to seek out Muslims to pray with and to pray with them in the name of Allah. In fact, Muslims have always <clears throat> been praying to Jesus. They just didn't know it. After I climbed down off the ceiling <clears throat> and I gathered myself, I went into the pastor, I showed him some underlying passages, and he went red in the face. And much to his credit, he immediately put in a call to the missions board, logged his protest, and told them this booklet was unwelcome in his church. Now, I have close contact with one of the largest non-denominational Christian missions group in the Middle East. And many of their missionaries hold that same viewpoint about Allah and Islam that I just explained to you. And even those missionaries who have some misgivings, some reservations about it, still adhere to it in practice because of the good results they seem to be getting in getting Muslims to accept Jesus. But all is not as it seems. Quite recently, <clears throat> I had dinner with two folks who are active in, in missions to the Muslims. One in particular who deals with it at the highest levels. And both of them were very eager to explain that due to this relaxed and enlightened approach to Middle Eastern Arabs, large numbers of Muslims have now become, to use their term, not mine, Christian Muslims. And I replied, I didn't understand the meaning of that term. How could a Christian also be a Muslim since they were separate religions? And their response was that these Muslims believed in Jesus and they wanted peace with Christianity, but they also retained their Muslim identities. And thus the long sought after middle ground had finally been found. So we all ought to rejoice and join in the effort. Well, a little later in the evening, I talked separately to one of the men and asked him this question. Have you ever asked these Muslim converts who Jesus is? And at that point, he leaned over to me and he confessed that indeed that this issue was troubling to him because the Christian Muslims who professed belief in Jesus did not believe that he was God did not believe that he was the son of God or was he God's Messiah. Nonetheless, he felt that while they did not accept the divinity of Yeshua, that they were, and that they were equally insistent on maintaining their Muslim identity, that they were either Christians or well on their way to becoming Christians. And he pointed out that many accepted modern-day Christian denominations essentially hold the same belief that Jesus was a good man, but he was not divine. And this also agrees with the beliefs of most of the modern schools of Bible scholars. So for him, case closed. The situation may not have been ideal, but it was a good thing nonetheless. Well... Yeshua seems to have a different standard for answering the question, who is Jesus? In Matthew 16, 13 through 17, it says this. <clears throat> when Yeshua came into the territory around Caesarea Philippi, he, answered, he asked his Talmudim, his disciples, who are people saying the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say Yochana, uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, John the Baptist, Yochanan okay. the Immerser, others say Eliyahu, Elijah, others say Yermiah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But you, he said to them, who do you say I am? Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter, answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
Shimon bar Yochanan. Yeshua said to him, How blessed you are. For no human being revealed this to you. It was my Father in heaven. I can't begin to tell you how this new distorted idea among many believers, among many Christian missionaries, of how Jesus is to be presented to Islam, even to the Western Gentiles, and what constitutes faith in Christ troubles my heart. I can't begin to tell you how catastrophic this is to our faith. I certainly don't hate Muslims. Muslims are certainly worthy of being told the good news of Jesus and being saved as much as anyone else. I have Muslim friends and acquaintances. Most of them are good people. But the Old and New Testaments are clear that our identity and which God we identify with and how to identify that God is everything for a human being. Here at Seed of Abraham, we have spent years studying the Old Testament And it is overflowing with stories of Israelite kings and of their their subjects adopting elements of pagan worship, of other gods, of the cultures attached to them, and then adding it to their worship of the God of Israel. I even gave you the scholarly name for this phenomenon, syncretism. And what was God's reaction to all this? Unequivocal condemnation of it. Sometimes killing those Hebrews who practiced it. Sometimes various disasters befalling his people in the Holy Land as a supernatural judgment. And in the end, exile. In fact, this was the primary subject of the many prophets the Lord sent to warn and chastise his people Israel. Therefore, I want to be clear in this matter. Allah is not the Arabic name of the God of Israel. It is a uniquely Islamic God whose origination is with the Nabataeans' moon god system. This isn't speculation. It's just historic fact. The Quran is a schizophrenic compilation of words that begins with respect for Christians and Jews but then quickly turns to demonizing us and demands that we convert to Islam or be subjugated as slaves or just simply outright murdered. The attributes that create the identity of the God of Israel are the opposite of the attributes that create the identity of the God of Islam. Identity. See, it's all about identity. And identity is established by means of name and attributes, just like it is on your passports. We are told by Christ we cannot identify both with God and with mammon. We cannot identify both with the world and with Yeshua. We cannot identify both with Allah and Yehovah any more than the Hebrews were allowed to identify with both Baal and Yehovah, no matter how they tried to rationalize it how much they insisted upon it for the sake of getting along with their neighbors. See, it's important to realize, and this is going to be the hard part for you today, it's important to realize that merely saying you believe in Jesus, that doesn't establish a saving faith. In fact, much of Islam might surprise you to know, accepts the reality the historical reality that a Jewish man named Yeshua, Jesus, lived and that he was a good man and a great teacher. So it's not that difficult of a step for them to go from a tacit approval of Jesus within the framework of Islam to becoming more familiar with his teachings, adopting especially his admonitions regarding love and peace. And this is because not all Muslims are warlike. It is this peaceful aspect of Jesus 
that Christian Muslims are accepting, but they do not accept his divine nature or his ability to save. Now, as a caveat, there indeed are Muslims who have sincerely converted. They've become Christians. I personally know a handful of them. But the key is they've renounced their Muslim identity. They have accepted the divine and saving nature of Messiah. And they would refuse the label of Christian Muslim. Therefore, in our day and era, we have to be aware and be alert that there is a category of religious people who look admiringly to Jesus. And I've come up with a name for these folks. I call them Jesusites. They're distinct from Christians or Messianic Jews. And they need to be looked at as separate and apart. Jesusites are those who accept that a Hebrew man named Jesus, Yeshua, existed, that he was a great teacher, a great philosopher, who preached love and tolerance, and that if the whole world adopted his attitude and teachings, we'd have universal peace. He was essentially the Middle Eastern version of Gandhi. And just as Gandhi wasn't divine, neither was Jesus. But to the Jesusites, that doesn't make him any less worth following. Now sadly, in what we could loosely call the church today, we have several denominations that have let go of their Christianity, or new ones have arisen, and instead they've become Jesusites. They want to retain the label of Christian, but I'm determined not to let them have it. Jesusites may be good people. And there are indeed no better teacher to look to than Jesus. But they're not saved. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. Therefore, they are not Christians. Because these folks still desire to be called Christians, it waters down the meaning and definition of the term Christian, which ought to mean what it's always meant. Those who know Christ as God, Lord, and Savior. And that sort of process of dilution of faith and a resultant disillusion of identity is essentially what King Nebuchadnezzar intended for Daniel and for his three friends. But Daniel refused to succumb to it. And his prayer reestablishes that he remains faithful to the God of Israel, who Daniel identifies by means of his incomparable name, attributes, character, and nature. Because outside of this, there is no other means of identification. Daniel was brought before the king. And the king asked him the same question he did to his Chaldean seers. Can you tell me what I dreamt? And interestingly, in verse 27, Daniel gives Nebuchadnezzar an answer similar to what the seers had given the king. No no human being, he says, can do that. Nobody, not even those who possess the knowledge of the Chaldean black arts, can tell the king the secrets of his dream. However, there is a God in heaven who can. And so despite the fact that Daniel's nothing special, he's no magician, he's no sorcerer, God's chosen to reveal to him what it is that the king dreamt and the meaning of it so that the king could understand it. What Yehovah revealed to Daniel is that the dream was all about the Acharit Yomaya, which is Aramaic. That's the same as the Hebrew acharit hayamim. A literal translation of those words, neither language, would be in the latter part of the days. Or, more familiar to us, the latter days. So what does that term mean? What's it referring to? Well, first, obviously this is referring to a time in the future. 
from when the words were uttered. Second, it's a concept that is entirely Hebrew. It's used regularly in the Hebrew prophetic writings. And of course, Daniel was very familiar with those writings. So whatever the king, the Gentile king Nebuchadnezzar might have taken all that to mean, we're to understand it the same way that all previous Hebrew writers and Daniel intended it. It is referring to some future time in which God will be dealing with the human race and it includes the involvement of the Hebrew Messiah. That's the latter days. Put another way. The phrase, Achrit Hayamim, lifted out of context and standing alone, then is only referring to some undefined future time, any future time. But in the Bible, when you take it in context, the phrase is in reference to a messianic kingdom, even if the initial manifestation of a specific latter days prophecy might not be in messianic times, such as Jacob prophesying the outcome of the 12 tribes in Genesis 49, but instead a later manifestation of that prophecy will involve the Messiah. As an illustration, think of the coming of Yeshua around 30 AD. He accomplished part of his prophesied mission, but the fulfillment of the remainder of the prophecies concerning Messiah only happens after his second coming. And of course, that's yet future for us. So here's an important, but I admit a bit complicated principle concerning prophecies of the latter days. For the people who were alive before Messiah came the first time, these people that lived in this range, The Akharit Hayamim was future to them. That was their latter days. For them, Yeshua's first coming would be the latter days they were looking forward to. What they didn't know then was that the latter days manifested itself more than once. And the second manifestation would be very far into the future. For us today, Messiah's second, the first coming, well, that's ancient history. Because we're up here somewhere. It's something we turn around to look back upon. So the latter days for us means when Yeshua comes the second time. Thus, In the Bible, there is a first latter days, and there's a second latter days. The first latter days has come and gone. The second latter days is yet to arrive. Both are fully valid. But as of now, only one of them has occurred. Well, now that your head is properly swimming, let's move on to verse 31. Where Daniel begins to tell the king the dream he had dreamt. The king saw an enormous statue that was made out of shiny metal. And for some unexplained reason, the sight of that statue brought on a feeling of fear within the king. So the statue was called terrible. It was the image of a man. The head was made of gold. The chest and arms were made of silver. The belly and thighs of bronze. Its legs were made of iron and feet and toes were made partly of iron, partly of clay. But then, something else that was mysterious and terrifying happened. A great stone struck that statue at its feet. It caused the statue to break into many pieces, which were so small that they, they, they blew away in the wind, the same way that chaff does in the winnowing process. This stone had been quarried, we're told without the work of humans and and tools. In other words, the stone appeared supernaturally. But even more, after smashing that statue, 
the stone grew and it grew into a huge mountain that engulfed the entire planet. Now, this statue in the dream was only an image. It was not an idol. It was not menacing. It was not alive and it did not move. The only moving object in the dream was that great stone that struck, toppled, and destroyed the statue. In fact, if we can take it completely literally, the statue was fully formed and present in the dream before the stone showed up to disintegrate it. No doubt the king was by now suitably impressed by Daniel's words and was all ears. So let's briefly consider that statue itself. First notice that it was one piece. Each successive part or portion melded right into the next. It was a unity. And what we can know in hindsight is that it represents the Gentile empires that will dominate the world in succession until Messianic times. The second thing to notice it is that the only undivided part of the statue is the head, the head of gold. The head, in other words, is a unified whole, but beginning with the silver chest and the arms, the statue becomes divided, so to speak. Or perhaps better, it becomes an amalgam of parts. That is, two separate arms are joined together by the chest. The same occurs with the bronze belly. That is, the joining point of the hips and the thighs. And then with the iron legs, we have two separate parts that don't really seem to have a clear joining point, And yet they work together. The feet are different yet in that they are a mixture of iron and clay. Thus, some scholars have argued that what's pictured is a statue consisting of five parts and not four. But as we move along in Daniel, we'll see that the clear intent of Daniel was to describe a statue consisting of four parts and not five. Now, something else we ought to notice. The hardness of the metals increase as we go from head to feet. Gold is the softest, silver next, then bronze, finally iron. Further, the specific gravity, in other words, the weight, the mass of each metal that's used decreases in succession from head to foot. Gold is heavier than silver. Silver is heavier than gold, which is heavier than bronze, which is heavier than iron. Even the value of the metals decreases as we move from gold to silver to bronze to iron. So there's obvious symbolism here, not only in the metals chosen, but in what order they're stacked that we're going to in time consider. So next in verse 36, Daniel says that now that he has told the king the dream, he's going to interpret it for him. Now, Daniel's speech begins with a preamble that sounds as though it's just the customary flowery compliments that are usually heaped upon a potentate of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's high position. However, that would be wrong if we concluded that. Essentially, Daniel is only confirming that a prophecy from many years earlier had come to pass. In verses 37 and 38, we hear Daniel saying that Nebuchadnezzar is the king of kings and to him has been given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. Let's dispel a common misperception here. Nebuchadnezzar was anything but evil in God's eyes. He was not looked upon as a wanton barbarian who ruthlessly and wickedly harmed the Hebrews. Jehovah had raised him up, had given him great honor, had awarded him with tremendous power. Part of the purpose of that power was to be used as God's means to appropriately punish his people for their syncretism, their unfaithfulness, and their idolatry. 
God was well pleased with the king and says this about him in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 43.10, tell them, this is what Adonai Zephaot, the king of Israel, says, I will summon Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel. He's my servant. Take him. Set set him on his throne. These stones I have laid here, he will come and spread his royal canopy over them. But then Daniel 2.38 goes on to say that wherever people dwell on earth, the animals and the birds have also been handed over to him. God has given dominion over the earth's creatures to Nebuchadnezzar. Does that have a familiar ring to it? Well, it ought to. Genesis 128. God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fishes in the sea, the birds in the air, every living creature that crawls on the earth. See, this speaks of the authority that God gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, in the 6th century B.C., the Lord was handing this authority over to the Gentile king Nebuchadnezzar. But this ought not come as a surprise to us. I'm sure it wasn't a surprise to Daniel. Because Jeremiah had prophesied exactly this. In Jeremiah 27, 1 through 7, it says this. At the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Yoshial, the king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from Adonai. Adonai says this to me, make yourself a yoke of straps and crossbars and put it on your neck. Send similar yokes to the kings of Edom, Moab, and the people of Ammon, Zor, and Sidon by by means of the envoys they send to Jerusalem and to Zidkiah, Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them this message for their masters by telling their envoys that Adonai Zebaot, the God of Israel, says for them to tell this to their masters. I made the earth, humankind, and the animals in the earth by my great power and my outstretched arm, and I'll give it to whom it seems right to me. For now, I have given it over. I've given all these lands to my servant, Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babel. I will also have given him the wild animals to serve him. And the nations will serve him and his son and his grandson until his own country gets its turn. At which time many nations and great kings will make him their slave. And for good measure... Through Jeremiah, the Lord emphasizes in chapter 28 his intentions. In 28.14, For here is what Adonai Zebo, the God of Israel, says, I have put a yoke of iron on the necks of all these nations so that they can serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, and they will serve him, and I've given him the wild animals too. So, we can just forget any notion of Daniel just flattering King Nebuchadnezzar or of the king of Babylon as being comparable to, let's say, the uh, um, Egypt's pharaoh of the Exodus. Essentially, Daniel is merely acknowledging that what God said he'd do, he did. But notice in Jeremiah 27, 7, that this God-ordained dominion is only to last three generations. Nebuchadnezzar, his son, and his grandson. After Nebuchadnezzar's dynasty is ended, God's wrath will turn from his own people to Babylon. Not because Nebuchadnezzar and his offspring were seen by God as evil, or that God had held off on his judgment, but rather because with the kings that followed Nebuchadnezzar and his royal descendants, Babylon ceased being reasonably accommodating to God's people, They ceased serving God's purposes, even though they didn't fully realize the fruits of their actions. In physical reality, physical reality, did Nebuchadnezzar actually have dominion over the whole planet? No, only over a vast area of the Middle East that was the center of early civilization. But he did hold sway over the known world of people of that day. Yet whatever additional nations 
Nebuchadnezzar might have decided to conquer would indeed have become his with the Lord's blessing. Next time, we'll carefully begin to dissect the meaning that Daniel assigns to the statue and to each of its parts. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.